Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us to stay curious today with a very special guest, Dr. Robert Camerite. Welcome to the, our Stay Curious set here today. We're so happy to have you. How are you? Well, I'm very fine and thank you so much for having me. Well, you're this welcome. This is a new experience for me, but I'm really looking forward to it. Well, reading your resume, you've had experiences that a lot of people have never had the opportunity to have. This gentleman, uh, his proud daughter, Kathy here, says that and you probably are the father of the atomic uh, test, uh, nuclear test, nuclear ban. test ban treaty. Yeah, father of the nuclear test ban treaty, as Kathy <laughs> helps me there. And I guess that's just because you've lived a long life there, sir. Right. But how old are you and, and how long you've been in this business? Well, I was born in, in, in August 10th, 1935 in Madison, Ohio. All right. And... Uh, I've been, I retired last year. Okay. And, and, and so I so worked. So 88, you I'm 88 now, and, and, and I was 86 to... when I retired. Okay. So. And I wished I hadn't retired, but that's beside the point. Well, listen to that, everybody. Marty Winkle, my co-producer, say hi to there. We and I talk about all the time, the people that we love talking to that are the old timers, I always stay active in something. and uh, And that's what I'm trying to do. Good, good. Well, we hope you do. You're going to hear some fascinating stories about the Mercury and Gemini program from Mr. Camerite here, who was a a, uh, uh, a guidance uh, and autopilot. And autopilot and, autopilot autopilot and, and guidance. guidance. Yes. Pioneering the autopilot and guidance, obviously, for our early manned space program. Uh, so I uh, wanted to say hi to everybody watching today. Stick with us. We're going to have a, a beautiful conversation with this gentleman. Marty, want to say hi to you. And if you have anything to chime in on our UCAC family microphone, please do so. For those of you new to the American Space Museum, for over 20 years, we've been preserving the birth of America's space age and its space workers' history right here in Brevard County. Doing and, a great job. Of it. Well, you've been very familiar with our museum over the yeah. years, and yeah. we've talked off camera about a lot of our founding fathers, like Cal Fowler and and Charlie Mars and so forth. Uh, what uh, what do you think about our humble museum that you can tell our watchers today? Uh, I find it fascinating, and and really, I'm I'm serious. That it not only American. There's some other history here, and it, I have a few questions that like the the button that that launched John Glenn. I I think that's here. Yes, and, it is. Yeah, and and. Uh, there was a number of things, and T.J. O'Malley supposedly unscrewed that out of the the panel there well, at one time. The, the I story, know Lee Solid says a bunch of them were looking for it. Yeah, it, what story do you have? The story I heard was maybe it was Bucket Milliken, who was a good friend of mine back Bucket in the day. Bucket Milliken. Bucket Milliken. Don't know many people named Bucket, sir. No, well that was his nickname, of course. <laughs> okay. but, but but Bucket worked with on the Atlas with a bunch of us. And the story I heard was they think that O'Malley told Bucket, go get the, the key. And, and Bucket undid it, and he had it at his house for 50 years or so until he passed away, and then his family donated it to yeah. here, which I'm glad to hear. So Absolutely. So. We have a nice, we show it all the time on February 20th, uh, John Glenn's launch in there. And we're going to hear a lot of personal stories, not just about his career, but some of his brushes with some of the famous uh, people of the early space age. So, uh, Marty, what you got there? You're showing me. Doctor, not mister. Doctor, yes. Well, mister, Marty's corrected me. <laughs> Doctor, absolutely. Uh, and there we have the little meme that we put up there. You have indeed uh, enjoyed a more than 60-year career. Also part of the after your years, uh, and after 1969, you said, you segued to the Air Force uh, AFTAC. What does that mean? AFTAC. AFTAC. AFTAC uh, was in 1972. This outfit called AFTAC, which stands for Air Force Technical Application Center. Things were a little slow in Brevard County in 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 the early 70s after the initial uh -huh. landing, and so politically, uh, state senators, I guess, wanted to get some more action to come down. So they talked this outfit called AFTAC that was in Washington mm -hmm. to move to Patrick Air Force Base. 
So they did oh. that in 1972 to bring more business into the county. And, and APTAC's mission is and was uh, to monitor the earth for nuclear testing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when this Bob left NASA in 1969 after the John Glenn launch, and not John Glenn, uh, Apollo 11. Apollo 11, yeah. excuse me. No problem. And, and uh, Bob Gray, my boss, big boss, said, why don't you want to get a PhD go off to Gainesville, why don't you take a leave of absence and then come back to NASA? And I said, no, I want to go and be a professor the rest of my life. And that only lasted about five years. And then this outfit, NASA, uh, APTAC came to Patrick and I was talked into going to work supporting huh. APTAC. And so uh, a couple points there just to make so you and the audience, mm -hmm. the uh, when when I was looking to leave NASA in 69 to go back to work on a PhD at Florida, I was told by a couple good professors that you're too old. <laughs> you're you're 34 years old wow. and you you know 20 years you'll be retire you, that's hardly enough time to to go well I fooled them. I worked from 71 to last year. Wow. So I put in, I think I put Another in my time. Another 52 years yeah. there for me. So They're I put in my years. time. That, that's fascinating. And we're going to have uh, uh, Dr. Camerite back to talk about his career with the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, a whole other subject of itself. But you were very involved with that. In fact, as you were 50 years you've sat on the Nuclear Test Ban Commission, correct? Yes, I, I was involved in that for 50 Good wow. 50 years, yeah. The things you know, I'll tell you. Okay. We can't. Uh, so I would be love to come back, and and tonight what I would like to uh, what I what we're talking about is the 60s when what got me into this space program, mm -hmm. which was a fantastic t part of my life. Good. And, well, let's get into that. And and one thing I would like to say is. This was not by design. Mike, I've had a wonderful career in my opinion. Uh -huh. uh, I've really enjoyed it, but it wasn't by design. Just things happen and you roll with them. And, and, and most all the time, they were good things. That's good advice for anybody in any yes. career, I think. You sometimes, uh, 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 the end of something is a new beginning, obviously. And, right. And uh, who knows what, what we have in there. Uh, Kathy, would you move that light over here just a little bit more on your dad? I think I didn't do that beforehand. That helps a little bit there. Uh, but uh, no, thank you. You can interject anything you want. Folks, you're going to hear a wonderful little conversation here uh, with Dr. Robert uh, Camerite. And there you are. What are yeah. you, 18 years old there? Well, uh... The I'm probably closer to twenty, maybe nineteen. Okay. The I I look a little no different. No mustache <laughs> yet. <laughs> no, no, and no, no gray hair, but you can't yeah, see it with yeah. that cat. So what? Let's let's let, get let on me with this let stuff. me just tell a little bit that led up to this picture. Sure. The I was as I said, born in thirty five, graduated from Madison High School in in nineteen fifty three, and uh, my father had passed away mm -hmm. a couple of years before that. And I was, oh really? Hmm. And I was uh, uh, wanting to go to college, so I did get a small scholarship and went to Ohio University in 1953 in, in Athens. Florida, in Athens, and and I didn't want to go to Ohio State for some reason. You did, <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, well, we're Buckeyes here. I tell you that. Okay. And where he grew up is on the the border near Pennsylvania. There, UCAC brothers. Uh, up there in uh, north uh, east ohio and and i and i enjoyed chemistry in high school so i wanted to be a chemist major and so i did went to ohio U for one year and and uh uh they got me a job on campus and 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 i took 20 hours as term and so it wasn't a lot of fun but but anyways i got through the first year went back to madison and my mother said since you left the farm, it's fallen apart. I'm going to Florida. Her mother lived in Daytona Beach. Mm -hmm. So I moved her to Florida, ended up meeting some nice young people in, in okay. Daytona Beach, and stayed 
But then come the fall of 54, all of these new friends of mine were off to FSU or the University of Florida or something. And I thought the world was passing me by. So I uh, heard that the Korean War GI Bill was running out the end of 54. Mm -hmm. So I went down to the draft board and told the, the, told the draft board, I would like to get drafted. And he said, you and everybody else. And I said, I thought he was joking. And I said, no, I'm serious. I want to get drafted. He said, I have a waiting list till April. I said, well, that won't work. He <laughs> said, yeah, you want the GI Bill. I said, yes. He said, go down to the post office and the man will take care of you. I went to the post office and he signed me up huh. for three years. Good. Sent me to Jacksonville. I took the series of tests that you take to get in the Army, raised my hand and all that, and they sent me to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Yeah, I, I got you. I got you. I, I spent a week at Fort Jackson, and then they said, okay, the names we're calling are going down to Camp Gordon. Uh -huh. Interestingly enough, nowadays, these camps' names are in the news. Camp Gordon later became Fort Gordon, and I've heard recently that it's now Dwight Eisenhower or something like that. Really? Hmm. But it's okay. just outside of Augusta. All right. Did eight weeks there, went home for a couple of weeks, and then went to, for the second eight weeks to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, mm -hmm. just outside of St. Louis. Did my second eight weeks there, and they sent me to Germany. I'm going to hurry. Yeah. And, and sent, right. me, to, sent me to Germany in, uh, by a ship. We took a train from Fort Leonard Wood to Brooklyn, got on a ship that took 11 days to go from Brooklyn to, wow. to Bremerhaven up in the, 11 uh, days in the Atlantic Ocean. In March. It's not fun. Had, it, had it, it, weather was bad. Handy yeah. all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so we got to Bremerhaven, took a train down to Zweibrücken, where we divided again, where I, I'm sorry, in Fort Leonard Wood, half of us that were in basic training went to Korea. The other half went to Europe, uh -huh. and I was in the one that went to Europe. When we got to Bremerhaven and then went to Zweibrücken, we were divided again. Half went to France. In those days, we had lots of people stationed in France. And then the other half of us, including me, stayed in Germany, and I ended up in, in uh, Gießen. Uh -huh. Gießen, 40 or so miles north of, of Frankfurt in the top of what was American zone then, next mm -hmm. to the British zone, next to the French zone. Hmm. So I spent two years in Gießen, Germany, in the hmm. 5th Combat Engineering Battalion. Okay. And just as a side on the, the 5th Combat Engineering Battalion was formed during the Civil War in Washington. And I heard in the news that a couple of years ago, it was disbanded after coming back from some overseas assignment. Is that right? So it, right. it was all that time. It was in Gießen for about five or six years, two of hmm. which I was there. Uh, the key point I want to make, and then I'll get off of this Army stuff, was when I got to Gießen, I was called into the early room a week or two later and said, you have the highest score in this area of the test we took. And we have an opening to go to this radio repair school. Do you want to go? And we were out putting dummy landmines in the mud and whatever. And I said, sure, I'll go. Okay. So they, I went to a uh, uh, school in Ansbach, and Ansbach's down close to Nuremberg. And surprisingly, when I got there, there were Army people, Navy people, Air Force people, the Marines, all Americans going to school there and the instructors were all English speaking Germans <laughs> and so it was an eight week school to start with DC AC and learn how to fix these radios uh -huh. World War II radios so uh, during the, the eight weeks there were a few people there that had college degrees in electrical engineering that were in this school with me and they said Bob what are you going to major in I said chemistry they said Go in electrical engineering. It's much better. Good jobs, interesting stuff. So from that school, changed my life's career hmm. from perhaps chemistry 
to electrical engineering. And so all three of my degrees are in electrical engineering. Right. And I have to say it was because of the school in Onslaught. Yeah, there's always a fork in the road that, right. uh, in our life's roads. What I enjoy about this little conversation about your military career is that then you spent over 30 years with the nuclear test ban treaty with these German places you were at on your mind all the time, right? Right. Kind of a thing. And, I mean, and, and I spent the, you know so many trips, 50-some trips, yeah. two weeks at a time, to Vienna, Austria. And, yeah. And, and, He's you know, been so to what, every test ban treaty meeting for 50 years in Vienna. And the only person in the yeah. world. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's I believe that. One of a kind guy here. We're talking with Dr. Robert Kummerite, and we're going to get into more about your career to Cape Canaveral uh now space force. Now we're going to talk about space. Yeah, there we go. There's a rocket. And which one's that? What are we, okay. You the, take it away there. I know you got your outline. Yeah. The the uh I got out of the army in fifty seven. I spent almost three years. I got an early release to go to college. Six weeks, I think. So I went to Florida in fifty seven and I graduated in nineteen sixty. Florida was a, a, a five-year program. In those days, companies, when they interviewed you, is, is this a five-year or a four-year engineering program? Mm -hmm. and, and today, I think they're all the same. But uh, it was a five-year program. But I was able to go three years in the summer school and graduate in 60. I wanted a job in Florida. And in 1960, just weren't many jobs, at least available to us, in Florida. Most of the job offers I got were in New England. I got a job offer from Nor uh, Nortronics, part of Northrop Corporation, uh -huh. to end up at Eglin Air Force Base. So that's why I took the job, because I would end up in Florida at Eglin, to go out to California, to Hawthorne, suburb of Los Angeles, to work on this Skyboat rocket. Skyboat. I didn't know what a skyboat was. Skyboat. This is in 1960. Skyboat was being developed be, to be four of them, possibly to be carried under the two wings of a B-52H. And in the skyboat was being developed so that you the B-52 could, could fly around some adversary and, if need be, could launch a sky boat with a nuclear head on it wow. and to some place huh. you wanted to. So uh, I spent six weeks, six months in Hawthorne to learn the guidance and autopilot systems. Hmm. Now, when you launch from a airplane, you, you got to know where you are from to launch it, and you have to know where you want to, the, 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 your payload to go. Right. So it had to have a star tracker on the system to, so that they could you could track the stars and know it precisely where you are when you launched it. Hmm. So it was fascinating. I spent six months <clears throat> scheduled and thinking I would be at Eglin Air Force Base. The schedule, schedule kept slipping, and I noticed that this outfit called Condra, and of course you'd see Atlas was launched from Cape Canaveral, mm -hmm that uh, was interviewing in Los Angeles to for people to work for their company. And and, and Condor was located in, of course, San Diego and, and built the Atlas. Yes. Uh -huh. So I interviewed in Los Angeles, and Condor, the, the fellow said, you're hired, go down, get in your car, drive back across the country to Florida, go to Cocoa, Florida, which is just outside Cape Canaveral. Right. And that's our, our office. And you'll they'll hire you, and they'll put you on the Atlas Centaur. Yeah. And so I did that. What uh, car did you drive across country? You remember? And, yes, I do. It was a 1960. I bought it new when I graduated. 1964. I think they could, were called Starliner Convertible. Oh, all right. <laughs> So well, yeah, and it took good. me a long two and a half days to Starliner drive. right there at the beginning. Yeah, okay, yeah. and there so, we go. So uh, I I uh, uh, left Northrop 
Is this the Starliner we were looking at there? Was that the image of that? That was the that was the Skyboat. Sky, uh, the Skyboat. Yeah, that Sky would, yeah that, Starliner is the car you drove. Yeah. The Skyboat that, is what you were working on. That's a Skyboat. And just as a quick aside, I'll jump 50 years or so. Uh-huh. Uh, last year when I graduated, I mean, retired. retired. <laughs> Maybe I graduated. Yeah, you graduated. Yeah. I retired last year. The two Air Force ladies that did my retirement did a fantastic job at Aftac. And they said, we're going to have your retirement out at Hangar C on the Cape. Now, I was working at Patrick. So, right. Okay. And I don't, if you don't know where Hangar C is, I can strongly advise you, find out. It's it's a hangar where Von Braun had his office back in the 50s. Uh-huh. It's a hangar near the lighthouse on the Cape, and it's full of old rockets. Yeah. And, and uh, it's fantastic to go Here, there. Yeah, here's a picture. And, yeah. and there's one rocket left, Skybolt, and, and it's they put it behind the podium. You, it's hard to see it, but it's there. Okay. And I've so been out they, there a few times. Marty's got a pass go out they there put a, They put a sky bolt behind the thing. And we're going to show uh, in a little bit here what they're, sh they're displaying there, one of your pretty uh, shadow yeah. box displays Shadow there. box, yeah. But, uh, so, so, but that's not, oh, yeah, that's you. Okay, is that you? Yeah, that's me, uh, and that's Dave Merker, who okay. was my boss, the last boss. At, at, uh, yeah, anytime at you the, can get a trip going out to Hangar C out there by the lighthouse, uh, it's part of the tour and a lot of fun on there. So, well, here's what we chose as our backdrop: the, the, uh, the on our green screen this, here. The this is Rocket a Row. Rocket Row, and this picture is from the '60s, '70s, and and down at the bottom, right where I'm, we're sitting. That's Complex 36, and then 11, 12, 13, 14. As you go up the screen, and those 36 through 14 are. A, old Atlas pads. Have you now, seen it from I the beach have, lately? I have been out there several years ago and it, like, it's sad. They're gone. Yeah. Most everything, all the towers are gone, yeah. which makes sense because they were metal and they rusted away. But, but the uh, pads are gone Yeah, but, in most cases. But, 14's not. No, 14's there. But uh, 36 has now got the huge, largest water tower in the world for uh, uh, Jeff Bezos' new Glenn rocket yeah. is going to be launched there. Yeah. And, and I, we'll talk about that later. And I understand. And I, saw I appreciate 11, your nostalgia. I do. 11 but, and 12 and 13 are gone. Yeah. Block houses and everything. I know. They just put a slab of concrete out there and they're going to lease yeah. them to yeah. other people yeah. out there. Well, here's and, a bunch and, of old timers. And uh, Well, anyways, when I got when I got to, to Florida in Coco, they said, go out to the hangar, I think, H or K, they, Condor had three hangers mm -hmm. in one of the hangers, and there'll be a, 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 a one of our higher ups will meet you there and take you out to the launch pad. And so I went out to, let's say, Hangar K, and a fellow named Les Cole, who was a, an off, a, a officer in the company, not an officer, but uh, boss, uh -huh. uh, met Executive. me and, and said, Get in your car and follow me, and we'll, I'll take you out to the launch pad. I followed him out. I'd never been on the Cape before, of course. And I followed him out, and we got to the ready room. I got out of the car, and I knew enough. This is not 36, and I knew 36 was the, 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 the pad I was supposed to be going to. It was Complex 11. And I said, I thought I was supposed to go out and meet uh, to 36. And he said, oh, you don't want to work on the, uh, what's the name centaur. of the? Centaur. Centaur. Yeah. Oh, centaur. Atlas Centaur. It was 36. And that's what they told me I would work on. And so we end up at 11. And 11, I don't know what 11 is, but 11 was testing the Atlas weapon system. And and uh, that's a picture uh, that you just showed of the, the, the people at Complex 11. It was... Civilians and military, most of the guys in the white are Air Force types. Uh -huh. And that was the whole crew at Complex 11. And their job was to launch dummy warheads down to Ascension Island and improve the Atlas as a weapon system 
to put in silos around the country wow. in 1961. So I'm in the back row on the top. Uh, cool. Quick story, we've been talking a little bit about people like Tom O'Malley. I walk in the ready room where I didn't want to be, but let's go says you're better off here than you are on 36. So I go in the ready room. First thing I meet is a guy named Bud Weidman. Well, gee, we graduated together at Gainesville a year before, or almost a year before. So, and then I was introduced to Joe Parker and mm -hmm. a, a whole number of people. And one of the first little war stories I was told, boy, are you lucky, Bob? I said, why am I so lucky? And they said, because O'Malley just left being the test conductor on Complex 11 and went over the Mercury program on 14. And you're, you're lucky he's over there and you're here. And I didn't know who Tom O'Malley was. So I said, okay, then I'm lucky. And, and a guy named Walt Hicks, who's sitting right in front of me on the blockhouse there in the picture, was the new test conductor. And Walt was a nice guy mm -hmm. and I enjoyed working there. So, well, uh, T.J. O'Malley, for those of you who don't know, was a, a uh, uh, well, he was a, I don't know how you'd characterize it in a politically correct terms. He was a, a very uh, demonstrative and individual, was And it? rather stern. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> stern and demonstrative. In other words, this was an era where you could get yelled at for doing stuff wrong. You could be... You didn't know what your boss was going to do. I've had bosses throw stuff at me, okay, in a dark room and stuff like that. Yeah. But T.J. O'Malley had a reputation being a little hard to work for, but uh, he was probably the right guy at the right time for a I, lot of things. Probably correct? so. In fact, I'll make a comment later. In, in okay. The, the one thing that's a couple of things I want to say about this picture here. Uh, this was in February, uh, probably March of of sixty one, and between March and late in the year, like the November time frame, this picture changed in that Complex 11, you know, developing a weapon system, was all Air Force. In, in late in 61, I was the last civilian to leave Complex 11. Really? It, it turned over all Air Force. Huh. A couple other things that it, we'll see a, a picture later, but I'll give you a prelude to it is we we launched E series at the time. It started A series, E series, B, C, D. We were launching E series, E's and F's were to go in the silos and whatever. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we were developing them and, and, and testing them by shooting them down to Ascension Island. And the, the second one I worked on, I worked on 12E, that was launched soon after I got there. Yeah, I just started working on it. it. It was a success. The next one was 17E, and it was quite a show for Cocoa Beach because we launched it at 3 o'clock in the morning or something. It got off the ocean a ways and blew up, and, and people in Cocoa Beach who were watching it had quite a show. Huh. And so, anyway, it, there were a number of failures with the atlases, and so the management in San Diego, or management in and Condor, at least, decided that they better change their procedures a little bit. So they said, we're going to change the procedure and we're going to take a young engineer, a engineer, send him to San Diego. When the Atlas is finished being manufactured, let him walk the, the Atlas before it leaves the factory through testing, test all the systems, come down to the Cape with the Atlas, and when it gets to hangar, it normally goes through more tests when it checks in. And, and, and he babysits it through the hangar test. Then it'll go out to the pad and he'll be involved when they actually launch it. Uh -huh. So I was the first one they selected. Oh. And I went to San Diego and then came back and, and, and babysat it through the hangar test. And then in November time frame of 61, they uh, Atlas had blown up on Complex 13, and they said, Bob, you go with several other guys to Complex 13 and help to restore the pad. Why me? I don't know. That It was half a sense. Yeah. So I went over to 13, and 
that's when my story about uh, you got to 13 and you had to go through the guard gate to get on the Cape, whether you came from the north or the south. But once you were on the Cape, there was no more thing. But on 13, they were building a chain link fence around it. And I thought, what's going on here? So <laughs> a few of us dummies said to the boss, what what are we going to what is going to be launch off 13 when we fix the pad he said, can't talk about it and she said, you can't talk about it hmm. and then and so we said, Why, what's so secretive about this this pad so we in our minds thought they must be going to launch a nuke into orbit or something that was our simple mind uh -huh. of thinking 20 years later 30 years later i found out what we were going to launch because it became public knowledge and not classified anymore. Uh -huh. And it was, uh, I may tell you later, but it was a Vila program for this outfit that I joined later called APTAC. Oh, the to Vila, monitor, the the Vila, Vila rocket satellite. program yeah. to launch. That's what, but it was in 61, they moved huh. the super secret. You got a lot of crosses there of things that you yes. cross paths with yes. and then later circle around to be part of. So anyway, uh, anyway, yeah, let's go. Some on. of these uh, rockets go boom. Okay. Uh, in fact, this one we yeah. have uh, in our Cape Canaveral gallery you're familiar with. Uh, I know this was between John Glenn's launch and Scott Carpenter's launch. It was. It was. And so I was over for a month or a couple months on Complex 13. February, late February mm -hmm. came, it came, and I was on 13, and they launched uh, John Glenn. February 20th. 20th, yeah. Uh, and, and immediately, I mean, immediately within a day or two of the launch, they, Kel Fowler and Bob Camerite and uh, several others were told, go to 14. So I left 13 and went over to 14 as an autopilot and guidance. Mm -hmm. uh, what I haven't said, and I'll be real quick about this, is in that time period, in late 61, NASA had put out RFPs, requests for proposals, for the first stage, second stage, third stage, command module, lunar lander, all that were put out, requests for proposals. I had, we at Convair, including me, had worked on proposals for each one of these stages. We First one was first stage. Somebody gets it, I think, North America. For next stage, somebody gets it. Maybe Chrysler, I don't know. Yeah, you're Third right. stage. And, and each time our bosses at Conver, when we didn't win, would say, well, we really didn't want that one. What we really, <laughs> really? want, what we really want was the command module. Well, the command module, we put a lot of effort into the proposal in North America. Right. So Grumman got the lunar module. And so there. if you, if you, yes. And so if you want to use my terminology, the rats started jumping ship. <laughs> wow, I conveyor. <laughs> yeah. Huh. yeah. Because I didn't know that was part of the conveyor history. That's interesting. Yes. yes. And, and so it, people like O'Malley and some of the conveyor types wanted to be part of the first man, American to orbit the earth, mm -hmm. but as quick as John Glenn was launched, O'Malley left the, the complex and went up over the whole organization. Other engineers went to other jobs hmm. that were Apollo related. And so that's why I was pulled over to complex 14 to replace the autopilot and guidance person that left. And so I was there for the next launch, which was Space history 60 years ago with Dr. Robert Camerite, we're so glad that you're sharing with us here. You take your time with what you want to share with us. We got all day and you're doing a great job and we feel we don't do enough oral histories on our program like this is more of, uh, sir. And, you know, just uh, you're going to hear some more fascinating stories, folks. Uh, let's uh, carry on here. Let's get you uh, past the boom stage there. I do know uh, the great Lee Solid, the rocket engineer for Rocketdyne, had engines on that. He said, we learned a lot from that. And also, I want to ask you, uh, uh, Murphy Wardman, who we've talked about, yes. was the electrical engineer there and a great friend of our museum, still at age 92. Uh, Murphy would say that rarely did the same thing happen twice, that you always figured out 
what happened on I think that's a true statement. And and maybe it was something down the line. But let me ask you this. Murphy said that when he get these rockets from San Diego, the ones that they didn't have to mess around a lot with usually weren't didn't have a success rate as the ones that they had to baby a lot. In other words, he said the ones that we massaged a little bit more always were a great mission. And the ones that sort of just came and we didn't have to do much to because they seemed to work be okay kind of had problems. Is that? I, I think that's probably true. But I, I would also add to that that if, if it were a war rocket versus a rocket that launched John Glenn, yeah. There's a big difference there. Okay. You worry about every little oh, detail. Oh, good point there. Yeah. yeah. And so the war rockets. Are, I mean, God forbid that we're talking about you arming these nuclear weapons uh, rockets uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis and right. so forth. You went through. So. Well, the one thing that uh, that picture you're showing mm -hmm. of the rocket blowing up, that's my rocket. Yeah. That's the rocket that I went out to San Diego. Oh, no, really? Oh. Baby sat through the factory, <laughs> yeah. brought down the hangar. The first and, one and, to do it. Yeah. And, and fortunately, <laughs> they moved me over to 13 in the Air Force crew. All Air Had Force to work launched that, that rocket. That there. That's my rocket. I always wondered if Scott Carpenter saw that because he got on the next one and, and repeated Well, I'm it. sure he did because we saw that. Yeah. It, but fortunately... That's a I hell had, of a photo. That I had left of... my rocket and gone over to Murphy <laughs> and watched it. You said it was that happened yeah. between Glenn's and Carpenter's yeah, launch. Yeah, it certainly did. Uh, there's your pad 14, Cameron. Yeah. Marty, we got a question there and interrupt anytime, sir. You got a question from Gary uh, Gerald. Was there a difference between a man rated Atlas and an Atlas used as a weapon delivery system? The difference between a man-rated Atlas II and and the ones that were going to have a weapon on them. Uh, yeah. The well, one thing, the and I have to think a little bit. One thing is the weapon systems were E's and F series. Okay. The ones that went into space for not only manned space but you know for like. Uh, going to Mars or something, were D-series. Okay. For some reason, they were D-series. So they were different, but I, I you know. Very technical things, yeah, probably. Yeah, Thank yeah. you for the question. Gary Gerald is our Vidalia onion farmer up in Collins, Georgia, oh. that uh, has watched our show uh, okay. faithfully. Thank you, Gary. Uh, what a bunch, you know. One, one thing I would say about this picture. This is uh, Complex 14. And John Glenn's in the front, and oh, and, really? uh, and and whatever. I, I'm I'm not oh, sitting down there. I'll bet. The yeah, down at the there. front city. Yeah, him and Scott. And, and Scott's down there also. I, I, I'm not positive of this, but I didn't go over there until after John Glenn's launch, mm -hmm. and I'm in that picture, not far behind John Glenn. Oh, and so I, I, and there's so many people in this picture that, I, I'm, I'm kind of guessing, but I think that. This picture was taken after his launch, and when they, you know, we changed the number of people because of uh, uh, people leaving, and right. that, that, that this picture was probably taken after his launch, but I'm not sure of that. Well, what I love about these pictures, and we see a lot of them, of, uh, is the places I've worked in the news business and other places, we never took a company picture like that. I just think it's so neat that you look back over over 60 years and uh well that's uh, a prized picture on my wall at home yeah well and, and the memories of the people you work with there and so forth and what you all accomplished in, for in america you know, i mentioned some of these guys bucket millican and some of them they're in this picture they, that's, you know, awesome. they, they that's sweet that's there. a great picture. Yeah. the fact that that was organized to do all that and you get yeah. a photographer out there to do that it's just neat there's yeah. a of course the atlas two going up there that uh, with a Mercury spacecraft on the top, and that's a, I believe the John Glenn launch. Scott, Scott mm -hmm. Oh, that's Scott, Scott Carpenter. Carpenter. Scott Carpenter, yeah. Uh, who repeated John Glenn's two orbits? Glenn went up in February, I think. Scott went up in May, the '62. Uh, here's a picture I've I've never seen this picture before. Uh, in President Kennedy, there. Yeah, in in, in May, we launched Carpenter. 
And then after his launch, it takes a while, we started getting ready to launch Wally Sharar, I think on October 3rd was it. Yeah, date. that's a great and, memory for and, sure. Yeah, and, and so uh, we were doing our thing for those months. Uh -huh. And out of the, you know, we, we weren't, didn't, weren't aware, at least I wasn't. Uh, September 11th, 11th came along, you know, getting close to Wally Sharar's launch date. And, we were told, go down to the ramp, ramp being where the tower is, where the rocket is. Mm -hmm. President Kennedy wants to talk to you. So they assembled us down at the in front of the tower there. And there's President Kennedy and Wally Sharara. And to the right there, the guy's kind of standing out. That's Kurt Debus, who yeah. was the, right who was the German that was ahead of... Kurt the, 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 uh, the NASA at Cape Canaveral. Wally's over this president's shoulder, I think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I don't know who's. Standing and there. I don't know yeah, some of those other Kurt officers Debus there. there. Did you see Kurt Debus a lot? Yeah, uh, we saw him He's somewhat. Been yeah, twelve years. He was and, and if you look between the the people up close, you see all those people in the background. I'm yeah. one of them somewhere. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, we were there. When Kennedy and Sharara walked up and Kurt Davis and so forth. Well, that, you don't ever forget that. No, that beautiful no. day. That there. was September 11. Yeah. Now, when you go to the next picture, maybe. In 62? 62. Yeah, yes, 62. 62. He's assassinated in 63. This was 62. Yeah. September 11, 62. This picture. Same day, they told us, us being the launch team technicians, engineers, to launch Wally Sharara, get in front of the tower and take your picture. So this is the launch team for Wally Sharara. Where you at in there, and, Marty and Mike? He's if you, with that yellow hard hat Oh, on. you got the yellow hard hat on. Yeah. All right. And we were talking a little bit about Joe Parker. I was an autopilot and guidance, but right in the front, second row, uh -huh. in the clad shirt there, Okay. It's Joe yeah. Parker right. that I was there. In you the are in the uh, yeah, in that yellow helmet. The yellow helmet there. And, the and Wally Sharar and so forth in the front row. Yeah. Very interesting. We've got John Glenn's hard hat that he wore on that, also in our case there. But like this I was said, taken on September 11th, the day that Kennedy before yes, or after. I don't know. Wow. What a day that had to have yep. been around the Cape. A lot of helicopters in the air, it sounds like to me, going on and stuff like that. There and, is a Wally. After the launch, uh, you can't read it on the screen, but see, just by his chin there, uh -huh. it says to Robert Kimmerite from Wally Sharar. Uh, and Wally gave each of us on his launch team a signed autograph. Did he really? And this is a copy of that. Huh. Well, we love talking about Wally Schirra, our astronaut wrangler, Nick Thomas, one of his favorite subjects is the Mercury astronauts and telling us about a lot of Wally stories, very serious about his space flying. He had a lot of uh, uh, to prove on his six flights because Carpenter spent energy, a lot of oh, fuel yeah, and stuff know. like that, got in trouble over it. And then, of course, the and great of course, commander that returned us to space in Apollo he, 7. He drove the right cover. Corvette also. Oh, did he? Yeah, he did. did he? <laughs> I, if it didn't, I had a 63 Corvette. Rathman gave each one of them a Corvette, and Wally's was the same color. So was it? So, so people used to sometimes mistake. Who Is that it. right? Yeah. Well, I also heard that Wally had a Maserati. I didn't know that. that. Uh, yeah, uh, on there. But uh, great stories there of our astronaut heroes. Okay. You're, you're, you're working with them, and I have them on my wall as a kid, as my heroes up there. After Wally Sharara's launch, I was contacted by this Les Cole. I mentioned that this guy met me in the hangar and took me out to Complex 11. Uh -huh. Les Cole. He had bailed out of Condor after we didn't get any Apollo contracts and went to work for General Electric who did win a contract called Apollo Support. General Electric had a Apollo Support contract. Oh. And this was in 62. And it was out of the, run out of the Daytona Beach. GE had an office uh, out across from the Speedway. So uh, right after Wally Sharara's launch, Les Coe contacted me and said, 
come to work for GE on the Apollo support program. I said, we're going to launch Gordon Cooper, Nick in 63, and I want to be on the last Mercury launch. And, and Les said, if you don't take the job now, you won't be on the Apollo program because we're going to fill all the slots. So I left Convair, left the Mercury program in December and went to work for General Electric. And interestingly enough, I'll be quick about this. General Electric, we had worked in Cocoa Beach in an office on A1A across from Bernard Surf, if one's familiar with that. Oh, yeah. The and why, why aren't we out at the Cape? Well, Kurt Debus does not want GE on the Cape. Mm -hmm. So we worked, I worked six months in Cocoa Beach, never set foot then on Cape Canaveral. Huh. And, had some good meals at Bernard Surf too yes. while you were and, there. <laughs> and, and so the task I was given was NASA's considering building this vertical assembly building to assemble the rockets in this building over in Merritt Island and then putting them on a crawler, moving them over to the Cape to launch. That's a lot of waste of money. Do a study, Bob, of why they should continue stacking the rockets on the pad like we do. We put the Atlas there, we put the Gemini on top of it, and we put yeah. the spacecraft on the top. You don't have to build this new big building. You don't have to have this crawler assembly. And and so I spent the better part of six months doing this report and study. Trying to stop the stop, VAB being right. built. And, huh. and uh, this picture that you just showed up there is I to the left there or the, the picture in there that's actually stacking uh, an, a Gina getting ready to put it on top of the Atlas with a spacecraft on top it is part of the I believe it's a Ranger program on complex 12 yeah and there's a, another picture I don't know whether it, it, it's no yeah yeah well this is good right right yeah that I was unaware that I had a relative named Herman Obert, who had been at Pinamunda and was mentor of uh, Von Braun. Right there he is. Yep. And that that's in his Herman older Herman Obert age. and yeah. Von but, Braun. But in 1929, there was a movie in Germany, Frau and the Moon, Woman and the Moon. And that's the launch vehicle coming out of the building where they assembled it on a track vehicle to go out to the launch pad. And Herman Obert was the technician in, in, in this movie. And and uh, had I known this, I wonder if I would have worked on this. Yeah, you didn't, never saw that beforehand. Because somebody must have been watching, had seen this movie, yeah. who was calling the shots on the VAB. I Woman don't on the Moon, Frau on Moon, Frau on the moon. 1929, and that is where we got the 1098 countdown was first done on this movie. And your distant relative there, Oberth, there on the left with uh, Von Braun, his mentor, or uh, mentoring mentee. Yeah. It, uh, it, interesting. Yeah, he was a technical He was a that. Saxon, so he was not German. And it was in the late in the, in the war when Von Braun got Obert to come uh -huh. to Pinamunda, and then Operation Paperclip. Uh, and he it, wasn't part of it. He wasn't part of it because he was not German. Ah. And it took ten years for Von Braun to get Herman to the United States. Hmm. And when he got here, ten years later in '55, he worked some time for Convair out in San Diego. And I'm told he was a guest guest at the launch on uh, Apollo 11, uh -huh. et cetera. And I never met the man. I know his niece. I've had his niece over and given her a tour of the Cape. But And her name's Obert also. Uh. But I have never never met Herman Obert. And he passed away sometime, sometime like 1990. Very interesting. I love I loved history crossing like that. So you're working for uh, GE uh, and, for a few years. And doing and, uh, this report, and this is in the June time frame of 1963, 
and uh, Jim Womack contacted me, and I was not, you know, it wasn't it was a failure in my report to not build a VAB. Anyway, but you uh, you did say that you did you said not build the VAB. I did I did write the that report. We could stack a Saturn V rocket on the pad. Well, I don't. You didn't know about <laughs> that. All right, okay. no. But but the von Braun was then in Huntsville. You know, paperclip went to Fort Bliss and then was in Huntsville, and and he had the Atlas Agena, the Atlas Centaur, and the Delta programs along with Apollo under him. And the story is that in early 63, he told NASA that I want to concentrate on the Apollo. Can you take these other three programs and put them somewhere else? The somewhere else was Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And so in the middle of 63, Goddard gets these three programs, Centaur, Agena, and, and Delta, and they have no launch team. So they're mm -hmm. looking for launch people, and Jim Womack contacted me. And so Jim, and I gave Jim a ride in my 61 Beetle <laughs> out to the Cape, and we hired in to NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. They called it GLOW, Goddard Launch Operations. Uh -huh. And so that picture you just Glow. showed Glow, Glow. Goddard Glow. Launch Operations. It, this picture, I'm in the back row, kind of behind George Lucian there. This picture is the Atlas Agena launch team working for Goddard Space Flight Center, part of Goddard. And the man yeah. second from the right there in the first row uh -huh. is Harold Schweigbaum. And Harold was the was the, our boss of Atlas Agena. They had another crew just like this for Atlas Centaur, and they had another crew for the Delta. All right. So they split, they hired three crews, Goddard did, to launch those three different things. So in June of 63, I went to work for Goddard, and I'm in this picture. To the far right there is Joe Parker. Joe was still with Convair, and I talked Joe into coming over to, you got that pointed at Harold. So I there. There. there, that's Joe. And so I talked them into hiring Joe Parker. And so Joe worked the Atlas and autopilot guidance on the Atlas rocket. Upper stage was an Agena for all these programs. And I wanted something new. So I worked the Atlas, uh, worked the autopilot and guidance systems on the Agena program. And Gina was built by Lockheed. Uh -huh. And so this was the Atlas Agena launch team. And we launched several different programs in the next few years. Well, you launched some important programs of the Moon program, the Ranger, pretty Kamikaze, much the pretty Lunar much. Orbiter, I mean, the Lunar, lunar uh, Orbiter, uh, uh, lo Surveyor, and then the, the Lunar Flyer, Orbiter. Project Flyer. Okay. Are you familiar with that? Flare? Fire. Fire. No, you mentioned. I'm Wait, it'll come fire. up in the yeah, pictures. Yeah, we'll come up in fire. Up. I wanted to ask you something. I I'll bet Marty would love to have your comment on this too. We love Robert Goddard, and we can't talk enough about Robert Goddard on on our Stay Curious program. I mean, if this man had the proper funding, he would have been orbiting things in 1947 right. or right. or whenever. What do you think about Robert Goddard and his place in history? Oh, I think it's fantastic. I I, I was well familiar. Probably the little thing, the, the the only thing I probably knew about before I started the Cape was Goddard. I was well aware of Goddard, uh -huh. and 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 I, I would also say this: a lot of what you know about Goddard was true about Herman Ober, but in the other side of the world. Oh, really? Herman, okay. Herman was in the First World War, and when he got out of the war, he worked on rocketry uh, as far as theoretical. Uh -huh. And he was at Munich working on a PhD. He figured out all the ways of having multiple stages and doing all that to, to fly to the moon in places in the 20s. Wow. And the university said, you can't go in space. There's no air. We're not giving you yeah. a PhD. 
And so Herman said, you can keep your PhD. And he designed pretty much all what went on later. But we'll look in though more. I misspoke about Goddard. He died in 1945. Uh, he could have orbited things in 1937, 30, folks, yeah, yeah. if he'd had the proper money yeah. on there. And uh, But that's a fascinating story in itself <laughs> about Oberth, and you're in, we're inspired to look into that more. Well, let's look at a couple of your other images here. There's a... Uh, Atlas of Gina, the Gina on top. Uh, Gina's familiar to everybody in the Gemini program. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh and you had a lot of success. You didn't have... Yeah. Uh, we... Not, not many of these blew up. It, no, uh, I don't recall any, really. Yeah, I don't think any of them. And, and you know, it was used on the Ranger. And the Ranger... I, I didn't work on the Ranger. The Ranger was launched with the Atlas Agena. And it, the Ranger was to go to the moon. Yeah. But they launched the Ranger. It crash-landed in the yeah, moon. Yeah, kamikaze and, and, taking and, and, photos. And took pictures as uh -huh. it came in. Yeah. Uh, but Ranger was launched off of Complex 12. Well, you'd be glad you weren't part of Ranger because they had six failures of the vehicle yeah. itself. I was the working on these other hitting. programs. Yeah, time. Congress pulled the, their their people in front of there and said, why okay. is this not working? But, and finally, but Ranger we, 7 in sixty In 64, we launched two to Mars uh -huh. successfully. Mariner. And, and then we were on these other programs. This is OGO which is an orbiting observatory that was launched with an Atlas Agena, and we launched it. One of the first uh, yeah. astronomical observatories right, ever right, launched right. up there. And the, when I went to work for Goddard, this is up in the main part of the Cape. This is the E&L building in our offices. E-N-L. E-N-L. I don't know what it meant. <laughs> okay. but, but my office was in there. Oh, all right, good. All right, uh, we're good. That looks like a... And that's the A -E, Hangar AE right behind E&L. And, &L. and uh, one of our guys, Skip Mackey, ran the telemetry lab in this building. Huh. Hangar S is just to the left of here. Famous and Hangar S, where the Famous S, where the, the astronauts were. and President Kennedy went to Hangar S and yeah. all that. This is AE, and this had the telemetry for the three programs I talked to, okay. for the, to, where we could go in and look at the data and whatever. Just a humble-looking little building there, yeah. and, and so much uh, pioneering uh, it's space It's rather interesting, stuff the cloud, it looks a like some, yeah, yeah. a bird or something. Did you have to take that picture? Just curious. Yeah. Did you find that? Uh, I think I, she did. Oh, okay. Kathy okay. is out. <clears throat> and, yeah. oh, I didn't say this, but Harold Schweigbaum was our boss. Uh, of uh, the Centaur, I mean uh, the Agena program, mm -hmm. Atlas Agena, and John Gossett, a guy named John Gossett, was over the Atlas Centaur, and I don't know who was over the Delta at the time, but uh, also, so Bob Gray was over all unmanned launch operations at the. That's gate. him on the left that's there. On the right. Oh, on the right's Bob Gray. Okay. Yeah, that's me on the left. Oh, you on the left? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit different. I yeah. Think. Yeah. Well, you're not rocking your mustache there yeah, yet. Yeah. So. so that's Bob Gray. And Bob Gray had all the unmanned launch up. Uh, you know, man, uh, not man, but right. the, not, not war rockets, but everything else. And so Bob Gray also had Thor Agenas out at Vandenberg. Oh, okay. And, and so uh, when, and he had a team that lived and worked out in Vandenberg. And when he would have a launch at Atlas Agena, uh, Thor Agena, launch in Vandenberg, he would take several of us, including me, to Vandenberg. So I made quite a number of trips in the 60s with Bob Gray to Vandenberg for launches. Huh. It was Where'd a little you fly? Bit, it was what a little air, bit. What, what airlines and airplanes? I huh? don't remember. I used to fly into San, San Francisco uh -huh. and go by Lockheed, where they built the Agena, the factory. And then drive down to Vandenberg, and then maybe drive down to to Los Angeles and fly home or something. But I made a number of trips out there, and it was a little bit difficult because he had a team out there, and I'd walk in the door and start looking at data, and they'd say, "Don't you trust us?" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it was a little bit difficult. Hmm. But Gray Gray said, "You're going with me to." Vandenberg. So, but anyways, in 1966, 
after these launches at the Cape and going to Vandenberg or whatever, uh, he got the Atlas of Gina crew together and gave me the one award in, in, in performance award. So uh, that that's Bob yeah. Gray. And Bob, Bob Gray's a well-known, uh, not so well-known Gray, in historical journals and stuff, but he was a mover and shaker. He later went the... on the Apollo program and then the, 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 the shuttle. Uh -huh. And I think he passed away something like 2002. Mm -hmm. Wonderful guy to work for. And that is Project Fire. There's no agenda. It's just the Atlas with a little spacecraft on the top, a little capsule on the okay. top. And the purpose of this is for the moon program, you, you have to go 17,500 miles an hour to get into Earth orbit. Right. You go to the moon, you're coming back from the moon, and you're going to be going around 25,000 miles an hour coming back from the moon. How do you come back at that velocity and land and all be safe and all that? Project Fire was a NASA program to put that capsule into Earth orbit and then fire its engine and accelerate it to 25,000 miles an hour to, to test the this velocity. And, and we launched two of them successfully, and that's the launch of one. Project Fire. Project Fire. Marty, I've never heard of that before there. Uh, that's, uh, uh, and I, I have seen that picture before. I wonder what the payload was on that. So it was, uh, so to, yeah, the reentry, I uh, think blade maybe, of shields and stuff like that on yeah, there. 65 time frame, perhaps. I don't huh. know, sir. Very good. And now there's a Atlas with an Agena, special this, Agena on it. This looks like probably Project Rendezvous. Yeah. What's yes, that? it is. Yeah. This is the Agena in orbit. It's, it's launched on the atlas, orbit. and then it separates, and it's in orbit. And what was the purpose of this? The purpose of this right. was rendezvous, and the, the purpose was spacecraft. the purpose was if you put the lunar orbiter on the, the the command module orbiting the moon, the lander goes onto the the moon, then they fire its engine, come back to the orbit. You have to rendezvous with the command module. So NASA, it five years earlier or so, had the Titan Gemini, the Gemini spacecraft, two men in the spacecraft, mm -hmm. rendezvous with the what we launched about the same time from Complex 14. Titan was uh, the Gemini was launched on 19. We launched them so that they were in orbit, yeah, 90 minutes in, apart, and yeah. they so they could come together, hook up. And then the astronauts in the Gemini could fire the Agena engine and change the orbit. And that was done successfully several times yeah. in, in the 60s. And it was in preparation for the Apollo program. Yeah, beautiful picture there. The docking collars on the left. You see the engine on the right. Took them up to 850 miles on uh, uh, Gemini 10, I think. Or yeah, I don't there. remember. And, but uh, but, but uh, I was thinking when I was looking at my tie, I probably have some of the Geminis that I launched the and helped launch. Yes, you do it, on that tie. It, you definitely yeah, do yeah. on there for sure. I mean, you got a beautiful uh, uh, tie there of all the mission logos on there. Well, we're so that's, the, that's a roundabout program. Yeah, we're enjoying this conversation with Dr. Robert Camerite. We have enjoyed some stories we've never heard before. Gosh, he's talking about when he was in his 20s. And here this man just retired. A year ago at age 87 you're 88 now and uh your memory is very good dr bob i, I appreciate you sharing well, these stories it's... right marty we're enjoying this a lot we we were looking forward to this kathy and i so i've been working yeah. at it but what do we have there a, okay a typical... this is this is complex 14 launch and in the launch is the you're launching the atlas the agenda is up on top of it i'm they're looking at the genus. So I'm not in this picture, mm -hmm. but uh, I would like to point out a few people. To the left, with the white, looking away, looking at the console. Yeah, yeah, help. That's Tom O'Malley. Okay. This is a launch of a of the rendezvous vehicle, the, the genus okay. to be rendezvoused with. 
Harold Zweigbaum, our boss. That's Harold there. I don't know what he's doing, but he's doing something there. Uh, let's see. Uh, he's, he's, Joe trying to, Parker. he's trying to get you on the headset. There. Yeah. What are you doing, Bob? There's Joe Parker there. Uh huh. The guy with his back right next to Joe, that's Ken McCarty. That's the guy that I work directly for. Okay. The guy up above them pointing something, that's Bob Searle. He was a deputy to Harold Zweigbaum in our group. So, and oh, just past Harold Swigbam, you see the dark head guy pointing at something or whatever. The guy right next to him is Bob Gray. Oh, that's Bob Gray. That's Bob kind Gray. of bald and Bob Gray there. Right. That's so T.J. O'Malley in action. It's a General Dynamics logo on the back there. Yeah, right? he was working. Yeah. He was uh, over Convair all of the launches. He moved up from Mercury. This is later in Gemini, and that was O'Malley. Wow, that's a great picture. Great picture. Uh, could I just say another thing about well, O'Malley? And of course. I, I'm out of step to say this, I no, think. No. Uh, O'Malley, this was a Gemini. After this program ended, O'Malley transferred, and I don't know all the details, but he went to work for, Convair was part of General Dynamics. And, and we called it Convair and we called it GD. But uh, he transferred up to New England on some uh, submarine. They had different, General Dynamics had all kinds of things. Yeah. And so Tom transferred up to New England in on, a, I think it was a whatever program. And uh, in 1967, this isn't in this talk, but I just mentioned it. I was working at the Cape on all this stuff when the fire happened on on Apollo, that, one, fire. Apollo one fire when they were testing the Apollo. George Page had left Convair, gone over to NASA, was with NASA during these Gemini launches, and then he was on the Apollo program. And when the fire occurred, I know this for because uh, I, I was told by these guys, George Page called Tom O'Malley. And when they worked on Mercury, there was some. <laughs> yeah. called Tom and said, Tom, we need you. Tom said to his wife, I got this from Tom. Tom said, you want to move back to Cocoa Beach? She said, well, whatever. Tom came back and headed up Martin, I mean, uh, North American on the command module. Yeah. I'm told, I wasn't there, I'm told heads rolled, and I, knowing Tom, probably did, and it, this is just Bob talking, and I'll just shut up. No. I believe a good part of the reason we landed on the moon in 69 was because of O'Malley. Really? O'Malley taking that over, huh? Taking, you know, the, the, can you can imagine what it was like after people die in the fire. Oh, and yeah. the test. We, uh, and uh, and uh, I think, fortunately, they had an O'Malley to come hmm. Very interesting. So that's all I'm going to say. Well, no, you're entitled to your opinion, and you that's live the history opinion. there. I, We talked to people, Marty and I, that lived that horrible tragedy, and it sets people's memories back, I tell you, even 50 years later, okay? Yeah. And, and yours, too, I can see that. That uh, it was a horrible uh, event, and a lot of good did come out of it, you know, a, a real good spaceship in there. But Tom O'Malley, we'll have to do a show on him, Marty, as, as he is one of the influential people with... Rocco Patron, uh, people that you just can't talk about going to the moon without talking about them. Right. Uh, Chris Kraft is another one. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the, uh, so, uh, but no, we, we, we welcome the, your thoughts on that. And there we've got the uh, another launch there. We got, uh, yeah, this is a... Uh, Centaur. Yep, Centaur, okay. Rather interesting, you know, I came to work that's on the surveyor. Centaur. Right? That's the Surveyor. One. Oh, the Surveyor. Yeah, that's the Surveyor, but the Centaur. The, in 67, the the uh, Atlas Agena program ended. And so we had that crew that you showed the picture. Yeah. And so uh, what do I do for a job? I think they told us we'd have a job, but I don't know. But I called George Page who was now over on the Apollo program. And I said, George, I need a job. And he said, what? What?" I said, the, the, the Atlas Agena is ending and I need a job. And George, on the telephone, George says, well, Bob, uh, I'll hire you for sure, but 
the kind of people I'm using, and they're doing watching tests and whatever, uh, you're too technical for this kind of job that I have. And he said, what's NASA offering you? And I said, well, they offered me to go to work on the Centaur. And he said, if I were you, I'd check out what the job is before I would. But if, if it doesn't fit, uh, you can come to work for me. So I took that and went over to the Centaur and they said, we want you to work on autopilot and guns, but we really want you, know, all this is Sanborn recorders, analog data, all that. We really want you to start computerizing and automating the checkout of the rockets more. And so I went over on Centaur with, after hearing George Page, and I worked the next two years over okay. on Centaur until Apollo 11, and then I left to go back to school. Well, here's an interesting... And, and a couple of those surveyors, as you know, were surveyor, instead of orbiting the moon, crashing in the moon, it soft landed on the moon so you could take samples and so forth. And Absolutely, so. and that's the one Surveyor 3, Apollo 12, walked up to a year and a half later right. and dismantled a year and a half after you la launched it there. So here's a little thing you threw in there. Wait, we'll go back here. Yeah, this... Uh, this RIPU. <laughs> I, after... A, Apollo 11, I went into Bob Gray's office and said, I'm going to leave and, and go back to get work on a PhD. And Bob Gray, I had done that before, which I didn't talk, I mentioned that for a master. And Bob Gray said, well, why don't you just put in for leave of absence and then when you get your PhD, come back and work for me. I said, no, Bob, I want to be a professor the rest of my life <laughs> and I want to work at a university and be a professor. So I'm going to just leave NASA. And, and I said, I enjoyed working here and so forth. But I said, and so Bob Gray had somebody in their graphics department <laughs> draw up this cartoon. And the little bit of the background was that I had been on a diet in 69. And it's, I guess they were worried about me because I was losing some weight. <laughs> and so the guy, when I was walking out the door almost in September of 69 to go back to Gainesville, they gave me this and said, there once was a Kimmerite named Bob who quit eating, drinking, and his job. And this got him an RIP, a PhD along with his RIP or whatever. But nobody can fall, call him a fat slob, it says on <laughs> And so nobody I I really, you know, the history at all, I, I, it's in the, Kathy's book. Yeah, that's great. Well, glad you shared that with us. So, uh, and this picture beer tree beer tree i noticed there this beer is bottles on a tree what's going on there Bob? this is on a uh, house on alachua lane in coco beach this is a time frame of 62 ish mm -hmm. and i'm on the left al padilla is the next guy to the right joe parker is the next side and bud weidman i mentioned his name before yeah. is the far to the right and that's El Padilla 65 Thunderbird. I was there. just going to say, I don't see those guys. I see that Thunderbird yeah, over there. Yeah, that's Martin, El Padilla. On the right-hand side and there. And these Ooh. are, except for Bud Weidman on the right, I went graduated with him in, uh, in 60. But the other guys I met when I went to Complex 11, and we worked for years together. And we, Joe had this house on Alachua Lane in Cocoa Beach. And so uh, we were all single. So we moved, shared rooms. And, and lived here in 62 and worked day and night out at the Cape. And we we liked parties <laughs> and we had a party here. And the next morning, I, I guess I probably put some beer bottles on the tree too, I don't know, but we put all these beer bottles on the tree and it took that picture and they called it the beer tree. So That's that sweet. was, that was life. It was quite different and quite nice in Cocoa Beach in the first part. That's the right. Letting off a little steam after all that stress yeah. of ro launching rockets there. We love seeing pictures and, like that. And There's a rare picture. I got this from Aptac, from the historian there. And this is what it looked like in the 60s when I got there into the 70s. And then hurricanes took down things, you know, and rust and so forth. But you see all these different rockets, yeah. or, uh, all kinds of rockets. Well, this is Cape Canaveral. This is Patrick Air Force Base. Oh, Patrick Air Force this Base. Is, okay. This is the this is this the the tech lab 
on A one A, and 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 when I worked for for you see the farthest away rockets to yes. the left, the building is a little bit higher there. Uh -huh. When I worked for Aftac up until last year, well until nine twenty fourteen when they so you had your tore there. all that part of the building down and built a new building behind it. That was my office on the third floor in that thing. But that last rocket, kind of black and white, yep. that is an Atlas Agena. And uh -huh. there's a Snark there and all the Minuteman and all those different rockets. It was beautiful. Looks like a matador. It, yeah. And, and this was out in front of the tech lab on A1A. Yeah, it was beautiful. I, I, I hate in, that in they fact, don't carry that tradition. In 61, there were no g gates. You could drive down, turn right on that road, that, that driveway there, pass the tech lab, and drive to Melbourne. And you didn't go through any gates. You, huh. Anybody could do that. Interesting. Marty, that, you remember those days, I know, when yep. he was out there taking his family out there, probably. Well, here we've got astronaut Scott Carpenter in your cell. Yeah. The, the, uh, the 50th NASA had an anniversary, 50th anniversary of Alan Shepard's launch which was, I think, in May of 61. I was working on Complex 11. I saw it. but And they invited all us people working for the government or for NASA to come out to Complex 5 or whatever. Uh -huh. I, I'm not sure. that It's where the museum is on the Cape, where okay. they launched the... Let's see, they, uh, what was the launch? Well, that was the Redstone. Redstone. Yeah, it was... Where uh, they yeah. launched... The, the uh, Alan Shepard and, uh, and Shepard and Grissom, yeah, suborbital, yep. And so, this was the 50th anniversary. So, my wife and I, and lots of people went out, and AFTAC people, and so forth. And so, I'm standing there, and the only old astronaut there was Scott Carpenter, and that's Scott Carpenter in there. And yeah. the guy on the right with the glasses that's John Tribe. Okay, our good friend John Tribe. Yeah. Hi, John. And he was escorting Scott Carpenter around. Oh, was and, he? And so my wife snapped this picture of me. I went up to Scott Carpenter. He didn't remember who I was. I told him who I was, and so we were chit chatting. Yeah. And so the wife snapped this picture, and so that's what. That's this a is. great picture. What a, what a guy, Scott Carpenter. There. There's Mr. George Page in his formal NASA photograph there. In this, these picture, these little write-ups are in her book. And I said there Your are... Your daughter a, Catherine's book. Catherine's, yeah. Together, yeah. And, and I said there are three mentors that I feel that I had in my life that really were great and really made things different. And uh, George Page was one of them. And... Uh, Bob Gray, this is the shuttle, of course. That's Bob Gray. Yeah. And the third was, uh, if you, and this was uh, Frank Pilat, and he was the boss's boss out at AFTAC for 35 years. He took care of me uh, just as well. Do I have time for a quick story? Yeah, you do. I wanted to go back to this, though, that, was that uh, Marty, uh, I believe that's STS 2 on the pad, don't you? Mm -hmm. You know how we know that? Both hmm. STS-1 and 2 had white tanks. Oh. STS-1 has a black ring around the top of the tank. And uh, thank you, Tommy Usiak, for telling us about that. Okay. We've got Dave Stange watching us today. He's up in Michigan. Gary Gerald's our, our farmer in Georgia. Bill Whiting's another one up in Michigan. Cynthia Rossi. She's in San Angelo, Texas, I believe, where my sister lives. She visits the coast. She's part of our astronaut group. Uh, Doug Forrest is another good friend of ours. Ophelia Sautrell, she's watching in Normandy, France. Oh, good to see you watching today, young lady. I wished I would have told the, the Obert lady in some of those. I... Yeah, Tommy Usiak's in, uh, he's a was a launch photographer. He is in, um, uh, where are you at, Tom? Lancaster, Pennsylvania. We got a lot of family members watching today. We got your daughter, Karen. Is watching. We've got uh, Lisa, uh, your niece, Lisa. Yeah. Linda Brown oh, yeah. is watching. Say hi to Linda and Christine uh, George, another niece, watching you today. Hi, girls. Yeah, proud of proud of your uncle here. I know. 
Uh, Marina R. watches almost every day, and she is in the Ukraine. Oh. And uh, we've got Cliff Watson in Pomona, Australia. Hi, what's your brekkie like this morning, buddy? Uh, and uh, Tom Celentano is in uh, Connecticut, and Neil 1030 is watching today. So glad that all your family members are watching okay. Uh, this this wonderful gentleman, uh, Dr. Robert Bob Kummerite. And we have really enjoyed hearing what you've had to share and take us out with whatever you want there. Well, I want to tell you the little story that, that, that I think you'll like. The, the, this story goes back to the Mercury program and uh, George Page and whatever. And uh, I told this story at around 2000, to a missile and space pioneers meeting, dinner meeting at the old NCO club, which is now the Tides on, on Patrick Air Force. Okay, but yes. I told the story there. O'Malley was in the audience. Uh, uh, Cal Fowler was in the audience. The place was full. And th th I think they really enjoyed the story. So if you don't mind, I, I'd Not like to all. reach to it. Please. Also, after something to do with the history in Cal Fowler, but they wanted me, and, and I don't know whether this is true, accurate or not, but they said, could you write up that story? And we want to put it into the space history to be opened in 500 years. I don't know if that's a correct. 500 years. That's okay. what I was told. <laughs> so I did write it up and gave it to, I think, UCF. I don't know. Oh. But anyway, the story is, and I'll, I'll try to get through it quick. I was working and getting ready for... Uh, launching Wally Sharar and the Mercury program. And in September 11th, as you know, as you just seen, the, the president came by, and then afterwards we were tidying up. And a few days before the launch date of October 3rd, I had a glitch in the servo system. And the servo system steered the engines with the inputs from the gyros or from the, the programmer and whatever. And all these systems are bolted on the side of the Atlas, which is the tin balloon, we called it affectionately. Hmm. And so I had a glitch. In being a man program, you can't have glitches. So I went into George Page's office that afternoon at five o'clock and said, George, I had a, we've had a glitch in the servo system. There's no way I, I have to change the servo. And launch day was just a few days away. And George says, yeah, you're right. How many weeks are we going to slip the launch for Sharar? And I looked at George in the ready room and I said, we'll be ready tomorrow morning, George. And George looked at me and said, Bob, I at least give myself some leeway. <laughs> and I said, I said, George, we'll be ready tomorrow morning. There's only one problem. I have a personal situation. And he said, what's the problem? I said, well, there's five school teachers that live in a house in a canal in Cocoa Beach, school, female school teachers, and I have my eye on one of them. And he, they are having a party tonight, and you just saw a party. And I said, I was wanting to go to the party. George looked at me, and this is the truth. George looked at me and said, Bob, you stay out here and take care of the Atlas, and I'll go to the party. <laughs> okay. And I said, so I left George's office, went down to the pad, got my head technician, and I talked to Leroy trying to figure out, uh, do I have the right name? And I said, we got to change the servo system and then run the test. And the guy said, well, second shift hasn't gotten in yet. It was late in the afternoon. And we, and I said, you and I, let's go down and we'll change the servo and get ready for the, when the shift comes in. So we went down and the servo was a thing that boated on the side of the Atlas in the pod, probably weighed well over a hundred pounds. And, and I said, I'll hold on to the servo while you disconnect the cables, the signals, and the, the boats, and then the two of us can lift that servo down, put it on the deck, put the new one up, and I'll hold it in place while you put the boats in to hold the new servo. We did that, and it worked, and we did that. And so about that time, second shift came in. I got the whole team together, meaning technicians and inspectors and all that, and got them together and said, 
we're going to run all the autopilot tests that you have to do with the procedures tonight. And we're going to start with the first test. And I'm going to sit here with my slide rule. As you we get the data, Sanborn recorders, EA recorders, analog, you give them to me while you're finishing the test. And when you finish the test, I'll be analyzing the data. You prepare for the next test. And when as quick as I can be happy with the data, I'll say, go, you start the next test, and so forth and so on. And by the way, there'll be no coffee breaks, no stopping, <laughs> one test right after another. And we want to get through all of these tests. I don't remember how many tonight. Six o'clock in the morning, we finish the last test without stopping. And in walks the blockhouse, uh, the group from the hangar that were in charge of data analysis. And somebody must have told them that we were about done. But anyways, they walked in and they came up to me and said, we're, we've come for the data. And I said, there's all the Sanborn recorders and there's all the EA, have at them. I've analyzed them, I'm happy with them, but you go, that's your job. You go do your thing and let us know if there's anything we can help you with or any problems. And at 7.30 that morning, I went into George Page's office, who had just come to work. And before I could open my mouth, he said, hold out your hands. I said, what? He said, put out your hands, palms up. And so I did. And he pulled a ruler, he put a ruler. I was desk for went. <laughs> I said, what's that all about, George? <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, you got a grievance filed against you by the union for doing a technician's job changing the servo canister. And I, he said, oh. good job, Bob. <laughs> and, and he said, how did things go? And I said, well, they've got the data. I said, I've analyzed it. I like it. And, and uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, we're ready for launch, but let's see what the data people say. And he said, by the way, I went to that party last night. Yeah, what happened to the and, party and, and the he girls? Said, he said, I talked to that sweet young thing, and I told her she'd better, mar better marry that young engineer. And when I gave that little talk at the Missile and Space Pioneer, and I said, and there she is. Oh. And so uh, they, the, the story that was told before that I won't repeat, was not pleasant in the MC after he told this unpleasant story. Does anybody have a nice story to tell? So oh. I put up my hand okay. and told this story in front of the, the crew. And by the way, when I walked up, O'Malley gave me the evil eye and I said, don't worry, Tom, it's not about you. <laughs> and and, and uh, Kel Fowler was there and everything. Yeah. So they heard all this story. So everybody really liked the story. And they and your wife's me, name. And my wife's name. And they asked me. What's her name? Janet. Janet? Yeah. How and long were you married? We're still married. Yeah. 60 years last week. 60 years last week. God bless you. That's yeah. awesome. So that is a hell of a story. I so have, I, we, I'm glad we didn't have to wait 500 years to hear it. Uh, but that's awesome. I, that, I, that's what I was told. 500, <laughs> 500 years. But but anyways, that's all tied into the, the sign out there at 14, the Mercury 7 uh, side and the light and all yeah. that. So. So the so I was talking about the light. Uh, yeah. There's a famous uh, tell tell that story about O'Malley. Uh, like to go out in the middle of the night out of Penn and he'd 14. get lost and he'd go into 14. How can you get lost? But he'd get lost. So he had him put out a light out on the the, the highway, going <laughs> where you turn to go into the complexes. So he would know where to turn in to go to to, to the complex. Then he ended up going out and smoking cigarettes under that light. Was that the yeah, light he smoked yeah, under? Yeah. Famously, yeah, and, we love and these stories. I, I said that that was the last story, but one quick story. It, it, back back in those those days, the the North Gate was out there by Complex Thirty Four Thirty Seven, mm -hmm. and and uh, past that was there was a shopping center up there, on on the going towards Titusville, okay. and there was a bar on the beach, and on the beach means right about where Thirty Nine is now. Really? Wow. Yeah, th that was off base then, uh -huh. and, and and so there was a bar there, and when I was on Complex Eleven. 
with the Air Force people and the civilians, quite often we'd go up to that bar after work, drink beer, and play softball out behind it, away from the ocean, in Sandsburg. So I've got Sandsburg City. <laughs> then when I was working on the Mercury program, uh, the Titan pads were just north of us. 14 was the last Atlas pad. The next pad was a Titan, 15, and then 19 was where they launched Gemini. And the Titan did not use locks for lock uh, oxidizer, did not use kerosene, used some other... Hypergolics. Uh, yeah, yeah. hypergolics. And so when they would tank for a launch or just doing a tanking test, we being 14 next door, the brown cloud more and often would blow across, The mm -hmm. uh, I think was the oxidizer. And so they would clear... 14, we'd have to go clear 14 because you get, it was toxic. Toxic flume yeah. coming yeah, across, across the breeze. Thing. So anytime they tanked, we had to leave the pad. So instead of going to the hangar like we were supposed to do, George and the rest of us engineers would go to this bar up on the uh, north of the Cape and, and uh, sit in there on benches outside drinking beer. And there was a the phone stand there, uh -huh. and George found the phone number of it, and he huh. told and he told the secretary when 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 we had to vacate the the, the complex, you go to the hangar, and keep an eye on uh, O'Malley, and if O'Malley leaves the hangar, you call this phone number. <laughs> so we were in there. I wasn't playing hearts. I was watching them, in watching them in the phone ranks. And George goes and answers the phone. And he said, guys, we got to get back to the pad. The, the, it's cleared and O'Malley's out. <laughs> and so we jump in our cars and race down on, on the, through the gate and back to 14, get in the ready room. No more than get in the ready room, sit down and walks O'Malley. And, and he said, how you guys doing? Oh, we're doing great. And never said anything. I can't believe O'Malley did not know what we were. You guys to. sitting there with a belly full of beer. Yeah, and... <laughs> I just want to tell that little story. But that was George Page. Those are some great stories here we've heard today uh, from Bob uh, Camerite. I got a, one or two more pictures here. We don't want to leave out. Uh, you got an award there, looks like. Oh, Something yeah. Going on there. Yeah. This picture, I, I then hope that, to be then able that's to... the last picture we have yeah. there. So. The, the, uh, this was, uh, on the right, is Dr. Zerbo. Mm -hmm. Dr. Zerbo was from Burkina Faso in the, up in the Horn of, kind of, of Africa. Okay. He, he uh, had a PhD from, I think, France. They were pretty well tied in with French. And he uh, uh, was working for a, a mining, uh, oil type co company in Burkina Faso. Somehow he got a job with the United Nations in Vienna. And uh, when they needed a new head man of the whole organization, and this is a big organization, the CTBTO, Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, he was selected. Well, first he was a head over the computer division. Mm -hmm. And then when that the head man was change they change it every so often he was put in charge but when he was working the computer group and then later he and i would take trips around the world together and we got to be real good friends huh. and so uh this in 2018 they were having their 50th working group b meeting started in 97 had three a year and then two a year. And in two thousand February, I think it was 2018, they had the 50th working group meeting in Vienna, two weeks each meeting, where they'd go over all this stuff and whatever. And I was the only one there that had been to all 50. Wow, of our nuclear test ban and treaty. And nuclear there. test ban treaty. So they had a big ceremony in a hotel down in Vienna and for for me and he was giving me the award. This is also during that time, he's giving me, like he gives presidents, 
a copy of the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Wow. They only give it to officials of government, like presidents and ambassadors and so forth. But here in front of everybody, he gives me a copy of the treaty. That's beautiful. Well, we're going to have Dr. Kemmerite back to talk about your experience with the like Nuclear to. Test Ban Treaty. I personally would like to hear more about that. And I think Marty would too. Marty, fascinating gentleman here. We've got a comment or question. Yeah, we have a comment that I'd like to definitely get recorded. It's from Anthea Humphreys. <clears throat> Great job. I'm going to share this space enthusiast at the Sparks Heritage Museum in Nevada. Did you hear that? Yeah. Well, say it again. Yeah. I yeah. Okay. It came from Anthea Humphreys. Anthea Humphreys. It's great, okay. great job. Great job. I'm going to share with oh, the... oh, oh, okay, okay. I, I'm sorry. My hearing. I got my hearing aids on. Great, great job. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, she's also going to share with. She said, "I'm going to to share with the space enthusiast at the Sparks Heritage Museum in Nevada." Well, thank you. The Heritage Museum thank in you. Nevada. There's an atomic. Uh, I, I'm not there. With it. I'm Good. Not there. Good. Yeah, thank you. No. Excellent job. Uh, Marty, anything else over there to button up on our Streamlabs job there? You got all these family members, your nieces watching you today. We've got our usual uh, group that uh, stay curious with us weekdays. Sir, I can't tell you how much I did appreciate all these. When, you, when you mentioned Nevada, I have to say this. Uh -huh. When I was in the Army in 66, they looked for volunteers to go to the Nevada test site. Yeah. To stand in the trenches. Bob who was right on the job into the early run saying, I want to go. Really? And they looked at my record and they said, we'll send you to Nevada with one only one problem. What's the problem? You are you don't have enough time left in your three years, so you have to re-enlist and then we'll send you to Nevada. And I said, I've just been accepted to the University of Florida in Electrical <laughs> and I'll have to turn you down. Boy, am I lucky. So many, yeah, so many options in your life. What a fascinating life mm -hmm. you've had. Thank you, your daughter, Kathy, uh, efforting this for us. And we do want to have you back and talk about the Atomic Energy Commission, something I know nothing about. But I guarantee you this gentleman who is like the father of the Atomic Energy Commission has kept our world safe in ways that we probably don't even understand. So uh, I would love to. We love we love to have you back, yeah. Doctor Cameron. Thank you so thank much. You. God bless you. You have you have an incredible memory. These stories of sixty years ago, you we were li reliving them right there with you, and that's okay. what we love here at the American. And, and it's Museum. been fun to go back and rethink on. And, well, and, you're and, welcome to any time, sir. Thanks a lot. We appreciate everybody watching our program today. Thursday, we'll do a little program about shuttles of the month of December and some other things. Friday, we're going to have. Uh, Jay Honeycutt do part two of his uh, stories about being a uh, sim. He was one of those uh -huh. evil sim operators in Johnson Space Center, crashing, throwing uh, problems at the Apollo astronauts. Jay Honeycutt will be here Friday again to, to share. To Thursday. No, Friday. We're going to do Jay. <laughs> he wants to record at 11 o'clock in the morning. In there, you're not going to be here Thursday, Marty, right? Well, we'll anyway, yes, okay. Jay's Friday tomorrow, potpourri of Stay Curious. So, hope that y'all enjoyed this. Tell your friends to watch us on YouTube, and most importantly, we'd like to have uh, you come and visit our museum. Everyone should come and see our sure. museum, right? For sure, yeah, this is wonderful. Well, thank you again, sir. And until next time, I'm Mark Marquette saying we can't wait to see you again to bridge the space between us. Thank you. Thank you.